You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Beginning with verse 1, I'm going to read through the chapter. There's 12 verses. We may not make it through the entire chapter, but we'll work our way through it. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When the Ashodites rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdodites. And he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod as well as its territories. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the Lord of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is severe on us, and Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines to them. And said, what shall we do with this ark of the God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. And they brought the ark of God of Israel around. And they brought it around. The hand of the Lord was against the city with great confusion. And he smote the men of the city, both young and old, so that the tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and the ark of God came to Ekron, and the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God, of the God of Israel, to us, to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines, and said, Send away the ark of God of Israel. And let it return to its own place, so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was deadly confusion throughout the city. The hand of God was very heavily on them. And the men who did not die were smitten with tumors. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Well, 1 Samuel 5 continues to record the Trans, what transpired next after the Philistines had taken the ark from the Israelites. Instead of God falling into their hands, he now was going to show his power. They took the ark as some kind of an artifact. They wanted to use it, supposing that they would get victory because of having this God of Israel in the ark. Now these were polygamous or polytheists, excuse me, and they were very uh, pagan in their thinking and all the countries surrounding them were as well. What they thought is even though they didn't change their idol gods, if they could add to it, it would just give them more strength and power over other pagan nations that they were in battle with, and especially 
the Israelites. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul informs Christians that the events of the Old Testament do this. Now, these things happen to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon which the ends of the ages have come. That's in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. So our present text shows the principles through this account in 1 Samuel 4 and 5 that are relevant to believers today. The Christian church today, and especially in the Western portion of the world, is very weak. It's in a weak state spiritually. We can observe from society the battle which seems to be moving rapidly, which bears a grave resemblance to the ancient pagan countries. They don't honor God, but rather create their own gods from wood or stone or even worship other idols other than Jehovah God. In uh, 1953, in a International Congress of Reformed Christians, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a pastor at Westminster Chapel in London for over 30 years, was one of the 20th century's leading voices in evangelical doctrine and preaching. Jones points this out. The parables between the parallels between the situation in Samuel chapters 4 and 5 and the modern church, surely it is nothing but a count of religion in a state of decline. It is God and God's cause apparently completely coming under attack by the great traditional enemy. The enemy is triumphant over the line (coughs) all along the line and and is rejoicing that this is the picture. The Philistine enemy, which he refers to as the present-day enemy, takes different forms at different times. Leading the unbelieving army today are secular philosophy and science. Philosophy has always regarded Christianity as foolishness. The apostle warned of this in to the Corinthians church when he said, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. Christian scientists, those that who know and love God, similar to uh, those who have the organization of the Institute of, for Creation Research and many other Christian scientists, study the origins of our creation from the biblical view. <clears throat> Such as Jason Lyle, who was here shortly and gave a conference a short time ago. Christians who and know God have devoted themselves to the science showing the proof of creation of God the earth, and all the creation that God has brought forth from Genesis 2 and 3, or 1, 2, and 3. So we, men such as Christopher Hitchens, who authored God is Not Great and How Religion Poisons Everything, and Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, have gotten great public attention and have shaped the thoughts of many people throughout the world. These uh, antichrist uh, attitudes and these uh, basically hate God have assaulted Christianity. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, if anything, the assault from science is even more intense. It is now taken for granted in secular media in public education, that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, published 160 years ago, not only shook, but destroyed the biblical account of creation of the world, thus freeing enlightening minds from the shackles of religion. Now that's 
from the secular viewpoint. London has placed Darwin's picture on the English 10-pound note. So they worship Charles Darwin. In a country that once celebrated the cultural supremacy of Christians such as Isaac Newton, John Milton, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, now prides itself by supporting the Philistine giant who supposedly slew the Bible. On the surface, we might very well come to the conclusion that the modern Philistines have been successful as their ancient prototypes indeed. Our contemporaries believe that modern Philistines really has demolished the church and the Christian cause. The secularization, uh, secularization of whole life seems to be almost complete, end quote. That's the worldview of non-believers. 21st century is far worse than during Martin Lloyd-Jones' period of ministry. He ministered in the 20th century from the 30s to the 80s in the 20th century. But the influence in our society today has progressed through the postmodern philosophical viewpoint. It looks even more triumphant than the modernists and Philistines battle over the church. Even the basic fundamental distinctions between male and female gender, as well as the institution of marriage, are under great assault today. Now, these were quotes from back in the 19. 50s and 60s. Look how it's progressed in that short period of time, just 50 years ago. Unfortunately, a large portion of the Christian church has given up trying to influence the culture with biblical Christian message and has rather adopted the worldly Philistine values such as pragmatism, relativism, sensualism, and as being necessary in order to reach the world with some kind of Christian message. This is where some of the universal church has gone. What a sad commentary that they are afraid to hold to the true biblical gospel. As we begin chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines took the ark and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. I want to, I've, uh, Peter's put up a map for us here. So I want to kind of show you the travel of where the ark started. We're in Shiloh and that's where the ark was situated. Then the Israelites took it into battle to Aphek, approximately 20 miles Then, when the Philistines have captured the ark, they take it down to Ashdod. Then from Ashdod, it goes to Askelon and Gaza, then to Gath, and then back to Ekron, later to Beth Shemes. So, as we think of this, the ark of God, which was a representative of God's presence with Israel, was taken by these Philistines. And as we look at this text, we'll see why they were moving it. The Philistines had not only uh, defeated the Israelites in battle, but they also had taken the Ark of the Covenant, which was taken into battle, thinking that God would surely give them victory over the Philistines. Now we saw that in chapter 4. And remember, the Israelites did not pray, they did not repent, they did not seek God's direction to go into battle against the Philistines. They were leaning on their own understanding, they had no high regard for God, and they were taking the Ark of the Covenant into battle just to assure them victory. 
not looking to Jehovah God, but just the artifact itself, treating it irreverently and as if it was a good luck charm. This is also the belief in our Western country. Our country is under God's wrath. We can see that in many ways. In Romans chapter 1, Paul gave this admonition. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was, has been made. So that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the one incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. The biblical historians of the Old Testament scholars describe the Philistine idol Dagon as a statue. Now, the statue had a head of a man, a bearded man, and on the head was uh, helmet-like on, on the top of his head. He had arms or the, like the upper body of a man, and from there, the trunk of a fish. And the, ended with the fin of the tail fin of a fish. That's what they worshipped. That was their idol, their God. <clears throat> yes. That's what Brian just said. I, even as an unbeliever, I could never even conceive of worshiping such a grotesque idol. But that's how far They had fallen in sin. God had turned them over. They would not do anything without their gods. And they would add their idols to these gods. Yes. Because this was was a good question. Nathal's asking, why didn't they go directly to to Gaza, Gaza? Well, or to Gath, I'm sorry. Because they were uh, directed by the Philistine lords, which it'll speak of in a little while. The Philistine lords were similar to kings at that time. So they were the heads of the Philistines and directed the army and directed everything the Philistines did. In all their wisdom, they decided, we can't have this here at Ashdod. So we've got to move this to Gath and get it away from us so this plague will leave us. That was their thinking. But why didn't they go directly to Gath? I mean, it doesn't even talk about their having any problems. Well, this is where the maps and the historians, from the text, it says that they went from Aphek to Ashdod, and then they had it at Ashdod, at the temple, and then they went directly to Gath, according to the text. This is just the, the routes that it take, takes all the way through as we go through the study. So, it, no, that's, it's not the chronology of that route, but that's all the different places where the ark would end up during this period. It's a good question, Nathal. Though the pagan nations would not change their gods, we look in verses 2 through 4. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon. Now, Dagon, this idol, they even had a a home for it, a temple in which he was placed. And they'd actually worship the statue, their idol. 
When the Ashodites arose early in the morning, next morning, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in place. Now think about this. They're taking the ark of the covenant. They're actually placing it before Dagon to help assist their idol. What happens? God knocks it over the first day. Though the pagans wouldn't change gods, they would add to them. The uh, God of Israel is now keeping their own idol and is going to destroy it. They think that their idol is going to be assisted, assisting God, or the God of Israel, little g, by the way, from the Philistine viewpoint. They just thought, well, God actually is inside the ark. Of course, we know different. In verse 3, when the Ashadites arose the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Think of that. Here's their idol, which they worshipped above anything, and they actually placed the Ark of the Covenant next to the idol. Now, God causes their idol to fall over right before the Ark, as if it was bowing down before the Ark of the Covenant. So they took Dagon and set him in his place. They positioned the Ark in which it was treated like another pagan entity near Dagon, thinking that having two gods they would have far greater strength against the Israelites. This was done in the form of an offering to their idol. Think about that. Using the Ark of the Covenant as a form of a sacrifice before their idol. That isn't the end. In the book of Judges, in chapter 16, verse 23, there's a similar account. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. So they actually didn't know that Samson was under God's judgment because of his sin, and they thought that their little God, Dagon, had caused them to have victory over Samson, their enemy. The Philistine leaders were gravely mistaken, thinking that this ark, seemingly to them, was just an idol, another charm, and it would give added power in their victory over Israel once again. They boasted of their great victory over the Israelites and all the foot soldiers that they had killed. Remember, 30,000 foot soldiers in this one battle were taken. Having punished Israel, that betrayed the ark by bringing it into the battle and giving it into the hands of the Philistines as well as using it in the same way as the Philistines did. This is what the Israelites did. They didn't reverence God by taking it in there. They were in sin. That's why they lost the battle. But they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle thinking, well, surely we'll win. They knew the history of Egypt and what God had done. The event happened in verse 4. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. And the head of the dragon and both palms of the hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This event happened the day after Dagon had fallen over the first time. Before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the head of Dagon and both palms and the hands were cut off right on the threshold to their temple. 
God causes this idol not only to fall before the ark, but destroys their idol, Dagon. It lay broken in pieces as if it were obliged to lay prostrate on the earth before the ark of the covenant. Yes. Yes. Rick just pointed out that it's interesting that they define it as cut off and not broke off. It would have been, the terminology would have actually been that it broke off. He broke, destroyed, just took it and knocked it over and destroyed it. So, but it was severed like a cut, clean. Yes, that is a, an interesting point that Rick's points out, that it had a clean break and not a jagged edge as a boss would have. Good point. God causes this idol not only to fall before the ark, but destroys the idol. It was broke in pieces as if it were obliged to lay upon the earth before Jehovah God. <clears throat> Christians should... Give, not give place to fear under the attacks of our adversaries. Our faith in God's word, in God, we should always remember what the Apostle Paul exhorted the Christians in Corinth. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taken captive every thought to the obedience of Christ Jesus. Now that was in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. The Israelites entered into battle with the enemy without repentance and without seeking the Lord in prayer, nor seeking guidance and victory from him. Sometimes Christians can be so insensitive to their own sin and simply lean upon their own understanding and self-reliance to go about their daily lives. And then suddenly, when they're attacked by the enemy, we fail to discern the weakened spiritual state that we're in. Neglecting to examine ourselves before the Lord with whatever sin may be a repetitive sin. We're admonished by Paul in Colossians this way. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to what? Idolatry. So as we recognize the reverence we show to God, We deal with sin in a fashion of obedience. We don't wait. We don't postpone. We repent and turn to God for his forgiveness and continue to serve him. The Israelites were not only sinful state when they engaged the Philistines, but they also showed irreverence and a wicked lack of honor for Jehovah God. They did just as, in a sense, in some manner, as Hophni and Phinehas, who were priests to be given sacrificial offerings to God, and they were stealing the offerings for themselves and then doing immoral acts with the women who attended the temple. Paul exhorts believers in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will be mastered by nothing. So we have to remember that sins are enemy. It's a destructor. As many of you were here for the memorial service uh, Wednesday evening, as Betty Kinney, we were remembering her life, Jim brought the message about sin, what a thief it is. And that's so true. We have to recognize that sin 
will corrupt our thoughts, our works, our attitude, and sometimes our deeds. We need to deal with it ruthlessly, as Paul commanded in Colossians 3. Verse 6 and 7, now the hand of the Lord was very heavy on the Ashadites, and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us. His hand is severe on us, and Dagon our God. God's judgment was not restricted just to the Ashdodites or those Philistines and Ashdod, but it went throughout the territories along the coastal region of the Mediterranean to other cities. Now these tumors, uh, some of the historical scholars uh, said that this is uh, actually a common plague along coastal regions in that area Back in that period, they had a disease that was like the bubonic plague. And tumors just actually describes the rendering there as the swelling growth. It was a de- uh, disease that frequently spread in the coastal regions. Initially, it was spread by mice and rats that came onto the ships and that landed in the ports of these coastal towns. The plagues in this case initially were affecting much of the coastal regions but continued to spread inland so that most of the residents in the local towns as are shown on the map were affected by this plague. It wasn't just there, but the Philistines and the other towns were impacted as well. This judgment of God upon the Philistines could have brought repentance on their part. And that's what it should have done. They should have realized that they were serving an idol, not the God of the universe, not their creator God. Peter. This part blows my mind because twice they come back there. Good point, Peter. We sometimes don't recognize how bizarre sin is. And we could be so blinded to pursue things that God hates and somehow think that we can find enjoyment from them. Maybe for a season, but eventually it's going to poison us. God hates sin. We need to recognize that and honor God. In verses 8 through 10, so they sent and gathered the lords of the Philistines. Now the lords again were the rulers like kings. They gathered Philistine lords to them and they said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. That was a question that Nathal asked. Why would they go there? They just wanted to get rid of it. They just wanted to go directly to Gath. And they brought, did you have, go ahead. And they brought the ark of God of Israel around. After they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great confusion. Now, this disease that came upon them was not only causing confusion, but death. Some of them were dying from this disease. So they were trying to escape this, and the whole, all the cities were in confusion. People were dying. They didn't know what was happening. But the Lord's did. These Philistine rulers, they knew exactly what was happening. They just wanted to get rid of it, thinking, oh, well, that if we get rid of the ark, nothing's going to happen to us. We'll be all right. No, God was going to plague them. We can't run from our sin. Surely God will find us out. Christian men and women can be trapped in some kind of sin and feel helpless to escape. Yet we have the promises of God which by faith through God's grace we can partake of. God says through the Apostle Paul once again, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, 
so that you may be able to endure it. God doesn't remove the temptation from us, but he gives us the grace to resist the temptation. He does so so that we can honor him in obedience. He also said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for power is perfected in weakness. It is in our weakness when we can receive. It's not when we're trying to endure in our own strength. It's when we acknowledge before God we are nothing apart from his grace. The Philistines were not brought to repentance by these calamities, but rather those who suffered from the deadly disease in Ashdod after gathering the lords and consulting with them in verse 8, in all their worldly wisdom, didn't call their people to repent before God of Israel and return the ark, but instead it was taken to Gath. The distance from Ekron to Gath was a distance of little over 20 miles on foot. So they could travel that in less than a day carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Those referred to as lords, as we acknowledge, were rulers. They would gather when there was an important decision to be made and they would consult with each other and decide how to direct the people under their authority. By their decision, they agreed upon transferring the ark from Ekron to Gath in hopes of preventing future and further judgment of God of Israel. They only brought further judgment and spread to others. Approximately seven months had passed as Israel was punished with the absence of the ark. This is a special, which was a special reminder to them of God's presence, but they had it taken for over seven months. The tabernacle in Shiloh was barren without the ark in its proper place. For seven months, the Philistines were punished with the presence of the ark. By doing so, he continued with the plagues. This historical event is informative for believers today as an example As I mentioned earlier, God has given us these as examples for us to learn from. God not only humbles and destroys the idols that are set up against him, but he also judges the people who worship and serve them. The first Philistines to feel God's wrath were the people of Ashdod. Even though Dagon's hands were cut off, the Lord was heavy upon Dagon's people. We see the connection between the tumors and the mice, which somebody, oh, yeah, Lenny was talking about last week. In 1 Samuel 6, 4, and 5, when the golden mice were offered as a sacrifice, one Reformed theologian gives this in his commentary. He notes that a connection between the rats and pestilence was recognized in early times. And the Lord may have terrified the people by having swarms of infected rodents overrun the habitations. So this was something that they didn't recognize. And as we look at in chapter 6, we'll see what they did to try to honor that. The Ashdodites realized that Israel's God was the cause of their calamity. God had gotten their attention just as he seeks ours today. In verse 10, the next, they sent the ark of, <clears throat> the ark of God to Ekron from Gath. The Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel around to us to kill us and to kill our people. The point is God's heavy hand against them for worship the, these false gods is universal and constant. In verse 11 and 12, <clears throat> they sent therefore and gathered all the lords and the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it return to its own place so it will not kill us and our people. 
for there was a deadly confusion throughout the city, and the hand of the Lord was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were smitten with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Now, those that have children that have to pick them up, you can go ahead and pick them up. I'm going to try to finish this text if we have time. This episode is not an isolated incident, but a warning of God's judgment on all idolaters. The experience of God's obvious judgment on the false gods of our time makes a similar point. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones makes this comment regarding this passage. Everything that is happening in this century is in the same way pointing to the judgment of God upon rebellious man and announcing the final destruction of all who do not submit to him. We may ask, well, why Christians so often defeated? And one Reformed commentator makes this statement. The episode of the ark in Philistia, or captured by the Philistines, speaks powerfully of God's people and to the Philistine world. What the message to Israel is and what the message to the church, what's the message to Israel and what's the message to the church? The point for us is to understand rightly the cause of our defeat in the world. The fall of Dagon before the ark of the Lord shows that we suffer defeat, not because our enemy is stronger, much less that the Philistine God was stronger than our God. Rather, the cause of our weakness and defeat is our estranged relationship with the Lord. End quote. We frequently hear that Christianity is waning because of today's society to a hostile gospel and being hostile toward the gospel. We cannot expect educated people to seek truth from the Bible rather from the certified results of science. We cannot hope for people who are drunk on sensual pleasures to be interested in church service, especially worship that fails to conform with popular taste and demands. We cannot expect today's people to give their video short attention spans to serious Bible preaching. The Philistines of secularism, sensualism, relativism are just too strong and biblical Christianity lacks a sufficient appeal, end quote. It is because of this view that many Christians and churches have concluded we must join the Philistines if we're ever going to win them. This shows us it's not the church's job to cast down the Philistine gods. The goal of God's people, based upon Scripture, is to honor the Lord in all things and to refuse to join the world's idolatry and remain faithful to our God and his word and his gospel. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We're not told to go on the offense against Satan. It says, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will... <clears throat> Be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm. Ephesians 6, 13. We are told to wage, we're not told to wage warfare against our enemies. In his own time, in his own ways, we can be sure that God will humble the idols of this world. We are to remember the one thing. The Lord to trust him and the spread of his gospel gospel to a lost and hopeless world. That is the hope that God left the people in this world. It's not for us to go out and fight the battles against Satan. It is for us to stand firm in the gospel and honor God. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.